Hi, this is Alex, and I want to answer a question, and I'm going to use this in a moment. Um, the question is, what do you consider the best postures for women who complain of frozen shoulders? Okay, so we're starting with a yoga assumption, assumption that yoga can actually do something. And we're starting with the assumption that a yoga pose could do something. So let's just break that down for a second. I personally would not start with poses. What we want to start with is one of two things, one of three things. The very first thing you should do, if you haven't yet, if you don't remember it, is check out Gil Headley's video on YouTube, and it's called The Fuzz Speech. The Fuzz Speech by Gil Headley. You've got to check this out, because in, in a short nutshell, it shows the, one of the fundamental reasons we could get a frozen shoulder. There's many reasons. It could be mental, could be emotional, could be physical as a source, as a reason we might be frozen. But, for, but in a, to a large degree, there's a sense that this won't move, and then tissue builds up around it. So for the person who's that, uh, for who that is the case, that the tissues won't work, or there's pain involved, then pose is the last thing I would do, or one of the last things I would do. To, to preempt, to set the shoulder up for success, there's two things that we want. One is pain-free movement, and two is to introduce change from the outside. So pain-free movement might look something like this. I walk in and I say, this shoulder is frozen. It hurts if I move it beyond here. It hurts if I move it beyond here. Without knowing anything else, one thing you could do to empower me is to start working with pain-free movement. Now, if we really open up to being creative, to letting go of assumptions and even what we think we know, we might just start out with, what's simple movement that would give me success without pain? And what this does is it starts to connect movement with joy, with pleasure. If this feels good, or at the very least doesn't feel bad, then my nervous system says, great, let's have some more of that, I like that. So we can start to build the movement pattern. There are many, many exercises you could do. You can pick any exercise and start with this idea of successful movement in a pain-free range of motion, breathing, relaxing, allowing the nervous system to learn, and then you can develop bigger and bigger movements. Now, the next level of specificity and skill would be to say, what does the shoulder do? What can it do? And what can we take it to do next? So remember that there's a few specific ranges of motion that build up all the movement patterns. One is elevation, depression, internal rotation, external rotation, abduction, horizontal abduction, taking it away from the midline, adduction, bringing it to the midline. We can take it beyond the midline, but we essentially have abduction, adduction. We've got flexion, and we've got extension. If I've forgotten any, you add it to the list below or write to me. But I think that's most of them. We can combine them in a movement that's called circumduction. So the question, one, one thing to do very specifically and very skillfully, would be to assess someone's shoulder movement and ask them to do each one and, and assess them, rate them, score them. How do they do on each one? And that way you can track progress along all of those ranges of motion. And what's beautiful is you don't have to have any exercise uh, repertoire to simply say, let's do a little bit of abduction. Hmm, okay, it hurts there, great. Let's hang out right there and play with a few other movement patterns. And just let it be gentle. Let the nervous system allow for success. If I can't take my hand out here with, pain, with being completely pain-free, then strengthening, challenging it, and loading it with force in a pose might be a horrible idea. Forcing my arm to come into shoulder flexion, when flexion is only one of about nine ranges of motion that I can do, might not be the best use of my energy and time to try to help a shoulder that's really, you know, very upset. So again, movement patterns is number one. Now, I'm holding this yoga tune-up ball because this is one of the best tools. It's squishy, so it's gentle as a therapy ball. It's one of the best tools you could possibly use to introduce movement on your own from the outside. Now, you can get a rolfer, you can get a great body worker, and I can recommend some people. And they are going to really, really help you if they know what they're doing. But this is a great way to, to work with yourself. And you've got all sorts of wonderful muscles 
that will affect your shoulder. So again, without knowing anything about why that shoulder is frozen in the first place, we know that pec minor is a really rich source of relief. Your rotator cuff muscles, your supraspinatus, your teres minor and infras, inf, um, infraspinatus, your subscapularis, so you can dig in there with your thumb. These are muscles that are really super wonderful to introduce movement from the outside. Then working into your deltoid, your lats, your serratus anterior, all these muscles are really wonderful to introduce movement on the outside. And if you don't have a therapy ball, you can use an apple. More seriously, you can just work it from the outside. And subtle, muscle, subtle movement from the outside can start to break up scar tissue and introduce more circulation to allow for, for the movement that needs to come in to, for healing to happen. So these are the two things. Pain-free movement patterns in your basic directions of movement for the shoulder. Play with pain-free movement patterns that, that involve all of your joints, including your neck. So this is much more skillful and highly leveraged than any particular pose you could do. And then once you've got a good foundation through the movement and through soft tissue work that you do on yourself or someone, someone else uh, introduces for you, then you can start to challenge yourself with particular poses held for a bit longer period of time. Always keeping in mind that what actually creates healing heal, here is the connection between the effort that you're producing and the sense of ease and comfort that you're holding. And when you work too hard, you actually can do some damage. So I invite you to hold the, the original definition of an asana and even of yoga, which is that intersection, the, 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 the place in the middle between effort and ease. So I hope that's helpful to really think through what would be really beneficial for someone with a frozen shoulder. And if you have any questions, email me at alex at iglesia.com. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Sound Yoga. Today I'd like to talk about what to wear for yoga. When I invite people to come to a yoga class, I often get asked, what should I wear? What will other people be wearing? I usually say that it's important that you wear something that is comfortable, but also something that is safe for you and something that's appropriate. Above all, you would want it to be something that's clean recently washed and something that you haven't worn all day. You don't want to look and smell like you just came from work or just came from cleaning the gutters. So clean. And socks. Socks get slippery and can be very dangerous when you're um, walking around on a wooden floor. So no to socks. Dress pants, jeans, Anything with a belt, snaps, zippers, something that could get between you and the floor and scratch you or the floor. So no to a belt, zippers, jeans, dress pants, no, something that's too tight you can't move around in, button fly, no to jeans. You want to be able to move freely. Form-fitting pants, something that you can see what your body is doing. But depending on the material, that perhaps they might be too slippery, like these, and you can't get any traction against your own body. So if it's slippery material, maybe not. So no to the stretchy, long, these are perfect. I love these. They're short, but not too short. And they have their own liner. Not too tight, but uh, not everyone in a class particularly wants to see everything. So these are my favorite. Um, they're also very form-fitting, body-hugging pants that may be uh, a bit too revealing, or perhaps a bit too tight if you're getting into a certain kind of twist. You want things to be able to move around a little bit, perhaps move out of the way. So let's talk about the shirt. If it's too baggy, 
you can't really see what's happening. You don't know when, or better yet, your teacher doesn't know when your body is touching the floor or it's not your body at all. So the loose spitting shirts and yeah, no. something you can tuck in. Yeah, that's good. But you have to be careful about the shirt because if you're going to be inverting and well, that could be a problem if it well, yeah, gets in the way. So, not too loose, not too tight, not too revealing. Uh, some people say, gee, for a guy especially, uh, should they wear a shirt at all? Well, if you sweat a lot, it might be a better idea to wear something that's going to soak up a little bit of it. And if you're doing something like a shoulder stand and you have your hands that need to have some traction against the body and you're very sweaty, then you can also come into some problems with that. So, what to wear? Comfortable, clean, appropriate. And some classes you can go to that you don't have to wear anything at all.